Hi, Pastor Warren here. Welcome back to our, our, this weekend's message. I hope you guys are doing really well. I know it's been a big adjustment these last few weeks, and I hope that you've been staying productive and staying positive. I know to pass my time besides writing messages and uh, doing other church things, I've been working on my yard a lot. And I have to tell you, I've been enjoying a lot of it. Haven't had too much time in the past, but now, given the circumstances, been working really hard back there. And uh, hopefully, I'll be able to invite you over soon and uh, show you what I've been doing. But I just wanted to keep you up with what's going on with my life, and I look forward to seeing all of you very, very soon to catch up with you as well. Hey, a couple of things I want you to know before we get into our message today is, one, um, be aware of um, future emails regarding our online prayer groups. Uh, We just had our first one last night. Um, and it went very well. Now, technology is kind of new to me, but some of you may be very familiar with web conferencing, and we have secured a way of doing it. So please look out for uh, future emails, and uh, all you got to do is click on the, uh, the account, and we'd love to have you join us. In addition to that, we have um, been securing uh, a means of online giving as well. So um, please look out for future emails regarding that, because we do of course, um, covet your donations for the church. Even though we're not meeting together, we still uh, really need you to tithe and be giving to our church. So thank you so much for your faithfulness and your dedication to all of us. Before we begin, uh, let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for another opportunity, Lord, to dive deep into your word. And Father, we've been focusing so much on um, not losing heart. Because right now, Father, um, with our given situation, Lord, sometimes it is easy to lose heart. There's so much going on, of course, in this world right now, and people are feeling it right now, Father. Not just the isolation, but even financially too, Lord. And of course, our health. So we lift up all these people, Lord, that are experiencing hardships right now, but we want to let people know that there is a God, you, Lord, that helps us, Father. And you help us not to lose heart when we have times of trouble and distress. So Lord, may your words speak to us this morning. For in Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Again, everyone, welcome back to our sermon series entitled Don't Lose Heart. Now we have spent the last two weeks unlocking 2 Corinthians chapter 4, discovering how the apostles did not lose heart in the face of their difficulties and challenges of the time. We have learned that first and foremost, they did not lose heart because of God's mercy. God's mercy. And God's mercy was and is our salvation in Christ. It is this mercy that gives us peace, it gives us comfort, and it gives us a new purpose in life. And the apostles understood their purpose, having served God, as the apostle Paul described in last week's message, as jars of clay that we are jars of clay that have been shaped and molded for God's purposes. And everyone, we need to embrace this illustration of being jars of clay that are used for God's plan and for his purposes. I hope so far, again, these insights have helped you to also not lose heart during these strange and these different times. And as we move to our next set of verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let me take a moment to talk about two things. And it's going to sound a little weird, but I want to talk about stickers, that is bumper stickers and t-shirts. Kind of odd, bumper stickers and t-shirts. What a weird segue that is, but I got a point behind all this. Why do I want to talk about bumper stickers and t-shirts? Well, because they share one thing in common. They like to make statements. Bumper stickers and t-shirts like to make statements. Maybe you're a little confused. Let me continue. Now, for example, bumper stickers. Bumper stickers are a generic term for just placing stickers on your car. I'm sure many of you have done that to your own vehicle. And who hasn't seen stickers adorned on the back of a a car window or, of course, a bumper while driving on the highway or maybe you're just driving in your neighborhood? They like to make statements. And some stickers that come to mind are this. How about this one? And maybe you've seen this one. Very popular one. My child is an honor student. Personally, kind of drives me crazy when I see those. But hey, they're proud of their kids, right? My child is an honor student. 
Or how about this one? You might see this, these numbers in a little oval that say 13.1 or 26.2. And if you don't know what those are, those are the distances of half and full marathons. Some people have run that and they want to proudly display their achievements. Also, you'll see other things like sea turtles, hibiscus flowers, these hang loose signs. I'm sure you've seen those too, or anything else Hawaiian. Apparently, it's very popular and people love having those on their cars. And ex especially this time of year, and usually every four years, you'll have bumper stickers about who is supporting whoever is running for president at the time. And lastly, of course, a lots of Christian symbols, crosses, fish signs, the ichthus, or perhaps you have proudly adorned your car with our own church sticker that says Grace Asian Community Church. I hope you do. On my truck, I probably have five sea turtles, that Hawaiian thing, holding their fins to represent my family or my ohana. I also have on the other side of my back window, my U of A sticker, woo-woo, and also on the other side, the University of Hawaii dad sticker to represent my daughter while she's in college too. And I know I haven't yet put our church sticker on my truck yet, but it's gonna happen soon. These stickers, everyone, all make a statement of some kind. They tell others who you are and what you like, what you're proud of, what you've accomplished, where have you been, your political affiliations, and what you believe in and what you hold your faith in. They make statements. Now, t-shirts, well, they're no different. Novelty t-shirts were so popular in my day when I was a kid. And if you're a little older, you probably wore these t-shirts too. Now, some of you who are, again, my generation, if you're a kid of the 80s, you might remember some of these shirts. Oftentimes in high school, we would sport our favorite rock concert t-shirts, right? Do you remember that? You would wear, they would always be black, and they would have whoever on there, if it was Def Leppard or Metallica or whoever, with the concert dates on the back. Everyone wore those proudly. Or maybe you wore your Top Gun shirt or Pac-Man, because that was a popular game during that time, or whatever was popular in the media. Also, there were slogans. People wore slogans on their shirts. And this may sound a little bit uh, more narrow in terms of, of where you when you grew up. And in the 80s, there was a shirt that said this, Frankie says, relax. Probably don't know what I'm talking about unless you're from the 80s. And there was another one that said, choose life. Those were very, very popular Well, when I was a teen. It just made you cool wearing these t-shirts because they made a statement. And the funny thing is you can still find these 80s shirts now in your local stores because they're so popular. And who would have thought fashion like that would just keep cycling around. I guess we should hold on to our shirts, right? The most popular t-shirt right now, however, <clears throat> while I was kind of Googling and searching online, was this one. I survived the coronavirus. Can you believe it? I survived the coronavirus. Now, it's definitely done in poor taste, but I understand that sometimes we need to have some hu humorous, things about making light of these serious situations. I get it. We sometimes have to make a joke of things just to make things a little less serious. It seems that almost everyone likes to make a statement in some shape or some form. Even as Christians, everyone, I believe we are all called to make a statement. It is a statement of what we believe and displayed in how we live and in what we say. We are called to make a statement that tells the world of the love and the hope of Jesus Christ. This statement I'm describing is better known as a testimony. A testimony. See, as the, world, as the word implies, testimony, it is testifying to others of my faith and of my belief. It is something every Christian should be able to share with others who don't know Christ. It is telling my story of what Christ means to me and how he has changed me. It is sharing what I believe according to the Holy Scriptures. It gives personal evidence of the truth of the gospel and provides, again, that hope and encouragement to those in need of the truth. It also is better known as a personal testimony. Do you have a personal testimony? See, when I 
read this next section of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the apostle Paul's words inspired me and they encouraged me and told me this, that there is power in my personal testimony. There is power in my personal testimony. And everyone, that is our simple truth for today again. There is power in my personal testimony. So let's jump in to today's verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through 15 to help us understand where I'm getting at, okay? So let's start, verse 13. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. Verse 15. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Verse 13, everyone, was just so powerful when I read it. So let me read that one more time. It is written, I believe Therefore, I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. You know, as jars of clay, the apostle Paul was explaining to the Corinthian church what had driven him and the other apostles to not lose faith even during difficult times. They were compelled, everyone. They were compelled by their faith to testify about Jesus, in which he says again, we believe Therefore, we speak. Apparently, Paul was also inspired by Psalm 116.10, where David said in verse 13, when he said, it was written. And that's referring to Psalms. Where in Psalms, it says this, I trusted in the Lord when I said, I am greatly afflicted. Now, if you know the story of David in the Old Testament, you would know that he was no stranger to affliction. His faith, however, enabled him to triumph over all these afflictions and to declare the loving kindness of the Lord. That would be God's grace, God's mercy. See, faith, everyone, in the Old Testament and also in the New Testament remains the same. And this is what I want you to understand, our first point today. We must testify our faith even through trials and afflictions. I'll read that one more time. We must testify our faith even through the trials and afflictions. It's so easy, everyone, to give praise to God when things are going well. You've probably heard this a million times. I mean, I really appreciate when athletes, for example, give thanks to God after they've won the Super Bowl or national championship or MVP or whatever sporting event there is. They give thanks to God. I appreciate that. I also appreciate some actors and some musicians that might win an Oscar or a Grammy. They will give credit to God or to Christ. Hey, when something goes my way, like when I go fishing and I actually catch a big bass, I'm the first one to say, praise God, hallelujah. Of course, we're thankful when good things happen to us. We are also inclined to praise when things are good, but how about when they're bad? How about when things don't go well. Maybe it's something difficult in your life. It's hard to praise God, for example, when you have just lost your job. You don't say, praise you, Lord, for, or thank you, Jesus, for losing my job. We don't say things like that. Perhaps what we ought to say is this. Although I am hurt, I know that you are good to always provide. Thank you, Lord, for being a great God that provides. Do you hear the difference? There's no complaining, but we have faith in a God that is greater than our situation. God is asking us to be faithful. See, whatever situation that might befall us, God is asking us to be faithful. Why? Because he is always faithful. Let me say that again. Whatever situation that might befall us, God is asking us to be faithful because he is always faithful faithful. And when we're faithful, everyone, we can be bold in testifying about God. That's the second thing I want you to understand. When we are faithful, we can be bold in testifying about God. Take, for example, the speech 
<clears throat> that maybe some of you heard recently by the MyPillow founder and CEO, Mike Lindell. I don't know if you own one of these MyPillows, but I'm sure you've seen his infomercials on TV. Now, he was invited to give a speech at the White House to talk about his company and other businesses as well um, from some other CEOs um, about how they're helping with the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic, that is. And he was talking again about his own U.S.-based company that has shifted 75% of his production of pillows to making cotton face masks, increasing 10,000 masks a day to hopefully 50,000 masks per day, again, in efforts to combat the coronavirus. Now, after he had finished his speech, he had asked the president to permission to add something off the cuff. And he proceeded, everyone, to share his faith. And the, one of the things he said was this. God has been taken out of our schools and lives. A nation has turned its back on God. I encourage you to use this time at home to get back in the word. Then he says, read our Bible and spend time with our families. Now this was live TV, everyone, and there was no editing and there was no time delay. He spoke about his faith knowing fully well that he was going to be melt, met with a lot of criticism and some hostility from the media. And he did. But apart from the criticisms of being a PR stunt for the president, or it wasn't politically correct or sensitive, or was it not the appropriate venue, let me ask you who are believers out there that vote Republican or vote Democrat or vote independent. Is he wrong? Is he wrong? See, when people have turned their backs on God, everyone, God is asking some of us to be bold and to testify, testify about him in order to bring them back. Let me read that again without stuttering. When people have turned their backs on God, God is asking some of us to be bold and to testify about him in order to bring people back. I think, everyone, that's so important for us to understand. See, going back to our scriptures, this was precisely why the Apostle Paul testified to this Corinthian church. They needed to be brought back into a proper relationship with God because they all had fallen so far away from God. And if you don't remember, the Corinthian church struggled so much by falling back into their old ways, falling back into a sinful life, and also being disillusioned and, and, and confused by these, these false teachers that had infiltrated the church. I think these Corinthian Christians had lost heart in their faith because they had fallen so far away. Paul again says in verse 15, all of this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. See, when we think about sharing our faith, we seem to only think that it's only for those who don't have a relationship with Christ. But it is also to help benefit other believers that need encouragement because what Christians don't fall away from the faith. See, our testimonies are to give people a story of hope and transformation that displays the grace of Christ. When we give our testimonies, people can identify with them and not feel so alone. There is power in testimony, everyone. You just don't realize it yet because maybe either you've never thought about it or maybe you've not been bold enough to share it. Let me give you an example to help kind of bring this all together. Uh, a few years back, um, I had planned a missions trip to China with my former church, and I asked some church members to join me. And of course, they were very excited and, and they were very nervous about going on this trip. But what they were most concerned about, that they wouldn't be able to do what they needed to do. That is, they felt unequipped, ill-equipped, that is, to be able to go on a mission trip. They would keep telling me, Pastor, Pastor, I'm not good at the Bible. I don't know enough. I don't know enough theology, and I'm just not a good teacher. I don't think I can be effective. I told them this. I said, leave the teaching to me. 
But the only thing that I request that I think is very, very powerful, everybody, is your personal testimony. That's the only thing that I'm requiring for you to have, a personal testimony. And they would also be able to share these personal testimonies to the local churches and to the students well, that we would be visiting with. Now, they were a little apprehensive because some of them never thought about their own personal testimony. Well, of course, to prepare, I had them come to a training meeting with a, and ask them, write out your testimony and share it with us because I want to hear it. We want to hear it. So, of course, that, that training session arrived. And all of a sudden, one of our members, it was her turn, and she gave a two-minute testimony. I kid you not. Two minutes. And I looked at her paper, and it was written just half a sheet. And that was it. Two minutes went by just like that. And I sat there, and I smiled, and I said, thank you. But I took her sheet of paper, and I said this to her, and I think I might have scared her, but this is what I said to her. I said, so after 40 years of being a Christian, God has only done a half a page worth of things in your life? I, maybe that was a little bit too bold for me to say, but I couldn't help it. Only half a page after 40 years of being a Christian? That's all he's done in your life? Well, her reply was this. She says, well, I don't have a powerful story. I don't. I was raised Christian, grew up in the church, and I focused on piano performance, in which I believe she has a PhD or a doctorate degree in this. So I pressed her a little bit more. And I started probing her life, asking her questions. I asked her about how she grew up, and she shared about how she had been depressed as a child because of family and educational pressures in her life. It was then she began to realize how God had helped her through these difficult times. And I also asked her about her marriage. And again, a light seemed to go off in her head. And she realized how God had been working in her marriage. As we continued to talk more and more, all these epiphanies kept coming up. And they came to mind of how God had his, his hand in her life. So I said, I ask you, here's your paper. Try it again. And next week, bring it back. Well, next week happened. And when she returned, she had a lot more pages to her testimony. A lot more pages to her testimony. But as cool as that was, she felt that when she, if she were to share it, well, it wouldn't be enough. It wouldn't be effective. It's not, it's not great enough. I told her, well, look, I believe this. When you're given this opportunity to speak to these college students, you're going to get about 30 minutes. But I guarantee you, and I was very bold, I said, I guarantee you, you're going to take so long, I'm going to have to ask you to get off the stage. Well, of course, she didn't believe me. Well, the story gets better. Her moment had arrived. We're in country, and 30 or more people in attendance came, again, many of them local college students. Of course, she was a bit nervous as she began, but as she shared her testimony, you could see so many of the students who were both believers and non-believers leaning forward in their seats to listen. And as she continued, there were those nods of agreement and understanding. You know, those nods about, hey, I get what you're saying. I totally identify what you're saying. And then all of a sudden, many tears were starting to shed by these students as she shared about her personal struggles when she was a student. And it turned out that many of these students were, guess what? They were music majors. They were piano performers and, and students. And they were currently going through those same similar situations with pressure from the family and with school. And of course, they were having problems with depression. And the more she shared, the more the audience wanted to know more. But guess what? I had to be the mean guy and cut her time because she was almost on there for an hour. And if I let her, she probably would have gone an additional hour. After the service was done, however, so many students came to her to thank her and many tears and many hugs were given. There, also, there were also more opportunities to talk with students one-on-one, -on -one, and definitely new friendships were made. Everybody, who would have thought that just a testimony of half a page would become a powerful testimony that would impact the lives of believers and non-believers? 
as the Apostle Paul put it in verse 15, I'm going to read it one last time. It says this, and I want you to pay close attention to this again. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Not only do people benefit, but it causes thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. God is glorified, everyone, when we share our personal testimonies. God is glorified when we share our personal testimonies. You see, I think we tend to lose heart because we fail to see how God has been working in our lives. That's what I want you to understand as we come towards this conclusion. We tend to also lose heart because we fail to see how God has been working in our lives. So here's my challenge for all of you this week, everyone because we all have a little bit more time on our hands these days. Take the time to pray and ponder how God has been working in your life since you accepted Jesus into your heart. Consider moments, consider situations, certain periods in your life, and yes, struggles you have overcome, and see where God has revealed himself to you. Then write them down. If, if some of you have ever kept a diary or if you've kept a journal, this should be easy for you. Everyone, write them down. Because you know what you're doing? You're writing your story. You're writing your story. And that story is to be shared with others so God will be glorified. Everyone, be that bumper sticker. Be that t-shirt that makes a statement. Display it proudly by boldly sharing your testimony to those around you. Remember, everyone, there is power in testimony. Let me pray. Father, thank you again for this opportunity, Lord, for your words to speak boldly into our hearts, so boldly, Lord, that we'd be willing to testify, Lord, to testify our faith to those around us, to those that have never known you, Lord, before, to tell them about the hope of Christ, Lord, because of the hope that we have received. And also, Lord, to encourage our brothers and sisters in Christ who have also fallen away. Lord, give us those opportunities. Help us, Lord, if we've never written this down or even thought of it. Inspire us, encourage to put this down on paper. And Father, to be prepared to share this important, important story with people, Lord, that come our way. Lord, may everything we do, our story, Lord, especially, glorify you. May it glorify you. Lord, again, thank you for this time. Be with everyone. Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone.